Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here again, and it's, uh, as always, a great pleasure to introduce uh, this year's winner of the Eppendorf Young Investigator Award. Now, it's my job to give you a little bit of background, and um, let me start by, if you ask students, incoming graduate students, uh, why they want to pursue a career in biomedical sciences, most of them will tell you, well, we want to cure diseases, or we want at least contribute to the curement of diseases. In fact, everyone who had the unfortunate experience to have someone close suffering or even dying from a disease knows this is uh, motivation. I mean, we all of us somehow, you know, why we try to work in biomedical science, we try to make a small contribution toward this goal. We all know about the spectacular successes of drug development. I mean, the case of penicillin, you know, is, is in everyone's textbook and everyone's mind. And uh, I think that also the improvement in general health and lifespan are largely due to these developments in modern medicine, drug development, and development of new treatments. In view of such, such spectacular successes, we tend to forget that there also have been spectacular failures. And oddly enough, uh, in some cases, these spectacular failures might open the door to completely new developments. And this is actually one of these failure cases I need to start with in order to make you understand why Georg Winter has done such fantastic work. Now, to remind you one of the worst incidents ever in pharmaceutical, uh, in, in the drug uh, development, was the thalidomide catastrophe, which is known to many of you as a Contagon scandal. Now, thalidomide was developed in the 50s by a German company called Grünenthal Chemistry. It was originally sold as a wonder drug over the counter for all kinds of ailments, you know, headaches, nausea, pain, sleep problems, gastritis, you name it. Uh, in particular, it was aggressively marketed as a, um, as a treatment against nausea, which uh, women experience in the first trimester of pregnancy. And I guess you all remember the history. It turned out that thalidomide is teratogenic, that it means it causes massive embryonic malformations on inner organs and limbs. And the catastrophe was really complete. At least 10,000 babies were born with major malformations, the dark number is probably, the hidden number is probably several times higher because it was also sold in developing countries where no good statistics were kept. And um, more of half of them actually died and uh, many of them actually had, uh, were living a life of severe disabilities. And uh, I, I don't, and there are still thousands of them living in Germany right now. So I don't want to go into the history of these side effects, how this was dealt with, how the company and the governments dealt with this. There are still lawsuits ongoing, and I think you can all read it up in Wikipedia or some other media. What I would like to say that after this, this drug uh, was actually burned. I mean, nobody wanted to look at this. No scientist's worth his salt would ever touch it again. And it actually turned out that it took only it took decades, and it was realized that, in fact, this drug, despite these horrible side effects, had actually some therapeutic use. And there was new research going up first some, somewhat hesitantly, but then it was actually becoming of increased intensity because it turned out it was in fact effective against ailments as different as leprosy and also some types of tumors. Now, it was actually proven to be rather safe, provided obviously that it was absolutely mature, that no female taking the drug uh, was actually having any chance to become pregnant during the treatment period because there, these side effects were quite severe. Now, interestingly, despite the steep second career of this drug, as a therapeutic drug, its molecular mechanism of action remained elusive for many years. And you might say, well, wait a second. I mean, nowadays you could not develop a new drug where you don't know how it's worked. But I might remind you that, for instance, the case of aspirin, it was actually very effectively used. It took 70 years until it, between introduction as a pharmaceutical agent until the molecular mechanism was identified. So this is not so uncommon. Now, interestingly, in the year 2010, a Japanese group actually, by, you know, doing standard biochemistry, uncovered the molecular target. Now, what is a molecular target? I have to admit, I never heard of this before. It's a protein called cere cereblon. Now, what is cereblon? Now, it's a unique substrate receptor of a ubiquitin E3 ligase complex. Now, that rings a bell among our biologists. So it means that the drug binds to molecular complex that mediates the destruction of specific target proteins. So how, how can this help in cancer treatment? It turned out that the drug does not inhibit blunt, but it rather changes its substrate preference. So this is a very interesting case. In other words, the drug tricks the ligase to earmark proteins for destruction it normally doesn't even care about unless the drug is present. Now let's pause for a second to consider what this actually means. 
Here we have a drug which is not as typically drugs are inhibitors of enzymes or transporters as, as most drugs actually operate. Rather, it redirects an endogenous pathway that is actually there for el elimination of damaged proteins towards el elimination of different proteins that are healthy. So, uh, by chance, these proteins uh, happen to include proteins involved in disease progression. This is why we have the therapeutic benefits, but it also happened to hit transcription factors which are essential for embryonic development, hence the malformation. To put it more bluntly, thalidomide hijacks the cellular destruction machine and steers it towards other than its physiological targets. And I should say that this is actually in biology is not uncommon. Some of you might know that uh, using the ubiquitin de um, degradation system is also taken advantage of by certain viruses. For instance, HIV likes to, uh, to subjugate uh, T cells by essentially disarming them by essentially targeting a ubiquitin ligase towards one of the defense guard posts, uh, the uh, surface receptor called CD4. Now, in any case, the mechanism of thalidomide constitutes a novel principle of direct action, and these findings set these findings set the stage for the discovery of Georg, uh, the winner of the Eppendorf Young Investigator Award of this year. Now, I leave it Georg to tell you more about it, but let me just give a little bit of background about this person. Now, Georg grew up in a small place in Lower Austria, close to the border to the Czech Republic. He then went to Vienna to the university uh, for his university education, where he also remained for his PhD work that he already carried out at SSM under the direction of Giulio Superdiforga. From the start, as he told me, he was fascinated by the question how small drugs work in biological systems. In particular, he was interested in molecules known for biological effects, but whose mechanism of actions were known. During a conference, as he told me, he met James Bradner from the Dana Faber Cancer Institute in Boston, and uh, he worked on a related question. Georg was interested and decided to join his lab as a postdoc. He was accepted and worked there for three years until he returned to Vienna, where he's presently leading his own research group. Now, the work Georg has carried out in Boston is indeed quite spectacular. I'm not going to steal his thunder by telling you anything about it. I'll leave it to him. Uh, I just would like to say that actually taking advantage of the ability of thalidomide to actually target a protein destruction machinery to other proteins, he could actually trick the system to doing something totally different. And uh, he will explain it to you. The paper he has published in Science is actually has turned into a citation classic. It's one of the most highly cited papers of the time. It's already drew 300 citations within two years. And what Georg told me is that now there are many companies actually trying to develop drugs on this uh, principle, on this new principle, and it seems to be developing to a mega uh, multi-million dollar business as we speak. I want, don't want to say anything more, but I would like now to ask Georg to come up here and receive the award and then give his lecture. So, let me see. The Eppendorf Young Investigator, the Eppendorf Award for Young European Investigators 2019 is awarded of, in the, comes with a check of 20,000 euro, is awarded to Dr. Georg Winter, Principal Investigator of the SEM Research Medical Center for Molecular Medicine at the Austrian Academy of Sciences, Vienna, Austria. The award is given for his pioneering work developing a method for targeting specific proteins for degradation using heterobifunctional chemical compounds to specifically recruit ubiquitin E3 ligases to the intended protein target for destruction. This powerful system enables targeting of previously undruggable targets and shows promise both in cells and in vivo in model system as an emerging therapy. His work has led to a fury of excitement across pharmaceutical companies and has resulted in several patents that holds promise to yield novel therapies for cancer and other diseases of unmet need. Congratulations, Kevin. Thank you very much. Thank you. For the picture opportunity, we should really smile, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> you look so yeah. serious. <laughs> okay. Congratulations again. Thank you very you much. Just okay, yeah. Uh, just leave it to you now the stage okay. to talk about your work. Thank you very much. All right. 
Yeah, thanks for the kind introduction and the perfect uh, stage setter. Uh, I want to thank uh, the award committee uh, for selecting me and I want to uh, thank Eppendorf for donating very generously uh, this award and, and in collaboration with Nature providing this really uh, unique platform for visibility for uh, emerging scientists. I don't want to call myself a young scientist, I'm 34 years old, but in science this, um, uh, it's always a bit different. Uh, and so I want to it's a great pleasure, of course, and a great honor to, to receive this award. And uh, as stated before, looking at that list of uh, previous awardees, where it's, it's really uh, a lot of scientists that I came to admire for, for many years, it's a, it's a very humbling experience. I'm very proud uh, to be standing here today. Uh, and I want to use the next 20 minutes or so to introduce you uh, in our work that, uh, that uh, you have been uh, introduced a bit before. And this is that work of uh, targeting proteins uh, for degradation. Um, and I hope this, yeah. Uh, so I want to start by introducing the core interest of my research lab, which is really uh, at an interface where chemistry uh, meets the science of gene control and transcription uh, and meets cancer research. Uh, and there's two questions uh, that motivate uh, my research and the research uh, of my research lab, which is the first one is, what are gene regulatory circuits that make up a malignant state? Uh, Genes, gene control circuits that uh, drive a cancer cell and that are important uh, for cancer cell growth. And this, the second one is how can we therapeutically exploit this? How can we use small molecules to disrupt uh, gene regulatory control circuits that are important for a cancer cell? And this comes with a huge challenge. And the challenge is that uh, only a very small proportion of the human protein is actually amenable uh, for therapeutic exploitation with small molecules. Uh, and the reason for this is that we have been thinking about small molecules in a relatively one-dimensional and, and limited manner. So we typically uh, want our small molecules to bind to hydrophobic pockets uh, on target proteins that encode some sort of biochemical activity. So very much like a keyhole and a key, we want to lock down uh, the biochemical activity uh, of a target protein. Uh, and so this works very well for proteins like proteases or kinases or receptors. Uh, and we, as a consequence, we call these proteins as druggable, uh, druggable proteins. Uh, the problem is that many proteins simply lack such comparable uh, active binding sites. Uh, and this is a particular uh, challenge, or this is particularly the case for proteins that engage in gene control, such as transcription factors, uh, transcription co-activators, also proteins uh, implicated in gene splicing. Uh, so what is a, a strategy how we could work around this? Is there a way how we could uh, eliminate uh, gene control factors? Uh, and it turns out uh, that one source of inspiration comes from a relatively unusual uh, scenario for us chemical biologists, and this is plant physiology. Uh, so what you see here uh, is the protein structure of an E3 ligase called tier one. It's a plant E3 ligase where a small molecule called auxin, a phytohormone, a plant hormone, uh, binds to it, complements a hydrophobic surface patch, and allows the dimerization uh, with a second protein. Uh, so only when auxin binds to this ligase, uh, the second protein can engage uh, this ligase complex. And this second protein is called IAA7. It's a transcription re repressor that by all accounts uh, we would consider as undruggable or chemically inaccessible. However, because it's recruited to this E3 ligase complex, it becomes recognized, ubiquitinated, and degraded by the proteasome. Importantly, uh, this is not unique to auxin. There's also other plant hormones that function via the same uh, molecular mechanism. Uh, but collectively, it should tell us that uh, by inducing proximity to E3 ligases, nature has outlined a strategy how we can eliminate uh, otherwise undruggable uh, proteins, in this case, uh, transcription factors. Uh, we call this a molecular glue type of mechanism. So now you may fairly ask, oh, that's all nice and fine, but you know, he, he told us in the beginning that he wants to work on cancer research, so how is that relevant? Uh, and uh, to answer this question, I also want to go back and repeat some of the uh, remarks that uh, Reinhardt had made earlier. Uh, so what you see here is the chemical structure of this compound, thalidomide, uh, have, that you have heard of, that was uh, released as a sedative under the brand name Contagan, uh, and then withdrawn because of these uh, horrible uh, uh, teratogenic effects uh, that I think are much more uh, impressive if you see one of these horrible uh, pictures. So this is really one of the darkest chapters in pharmacology, but it was uh, become very interesting when it was discovered that these molecules and structurally very similar molecules that we co collectively refer to as imids have a certain anti-neoplastic activity. That means they stop the proliferation 
of certain cancer uh, cells in this type, uh, in this case, B cell malignant uh, cancer cells. Um, and at this point, even though it was already used in patients again, still nobody knew the molecular mechanism. And as we have heard before, it was then up to a Japanese research group uh, led by a scientist <coughs> called Hiroshi Handa, who uh, used a chemical proteomics uh, affinity purification approach where they immobilized thalidomide on beads and asked a simple question, what are the proteins binding to thalidomide? Uh, and they identified one particular protein uh, that uh, stood out here, which is that protein called cerebron. So cerebron acts as a substrate receptor of another E3 ligase complex. Uh, and importantly, thalidomide was shown by very seminal work from Ben Ebert and Bill Kalen and colleagues not to inhibit uh, this E3 ligase, but modulate its, uh, or basically create a new substrate binding site for different zinc finger transcription factors. So very similar to what you have seen before uh, with auxin and the tier one ligase, uh, this allows recruitment of otherwise undruggable proteins uh, that are then recognized by that uh, E3 ligase complex become ubiquitinated and degraded by the proteasome, as you see also here uh, taken out of one of these uh, very seminal papers. So for us, this really set the stage for asking the question, can we hack this molecular mechanism? Can we capitalize on this molecular mechanism but devise a more generalizable strategy? Because importantly, as uh, you have heard, lenalidomide or these emit type of molecules were never designed to degrade this transcription factor. This was a coincidence that uh, took us 60 to 70 years to understand. And inspired by uh, pioneering work from Craig Cruz and colleagues, mostly on peptidic ligands, we decided to uh, try the following. We wanted to make heterobifunctional molecules. These are molecules with two arms, where one arm would still bind to the cerebron E3 ligase, and the second arm would simply bind to any protein of interest. Uh, proteins that we want to get rid of for a therapeutic purpose. And so the hypothesis was that, again, we can induce molecular proximity, molecular closeness, that should be sufficient uh, for this E3 ligase complex to recognize this foreign protein and transfer ubiquitin uh, residues to earmark it for degradation. The first protein we decided to work on is a transcriptional co-activator called BRD4. Uh, it has two N-terminal bromo domains and sits on acetylated chromatin. It, it's located to uh, enhancers and promoters and is known as a positive uh, transcription regulator. Um, we have chosen this particular protein not only because it's relevant to many uh, cancers, including leukemias, but also because we have a small molecule ligand that we know would bind uh, very tightly to these two N-terminal bromo domains. Uh, and we know that this ligand is very well behaved. So it was a perfect test case to test drive this uh, idea. And so uh, we made the first molecule that also the non-chemists among us can appreciate. One part looks very much like JK1, one part looks very much like thalidomide, and then we have a, a flexible aliphatic linker connecting these two elements. And it turns out that the constitution and the length of this linker uh, is very important. Uh, so then we ask the question, can we use this molecule to induce molecular proximity? And we did this by developing a recombinant binding assay where we would link recombinant BRD4 to beads, we would link recombinant cerebellum to beads, and then we can measure molecular closeness simply by the emission of light. Um, and that's what we did here, and what we observed is that with increasing concentration of our molecule uh, DBAT1, we see an increase of signal, meaning we bring these two proteins together. There's a certain point where uh, the system is saturated, meaning every protein has their own bed degrader and it outcompetes itself. And this is something very characteristic for the dynamics of ternary complex formation. Uh, we call this the hook effect. Um, so it seems that we can induce proximity. Uh, we also solved the crystal structure of this um, compound uh, DBAT1 uh, with BAD4, and we realized that it binds uh, to these bromo domains with a relatively conserved molecular recognition uh, uh, compared to the parental ligand JQ1. It became really interesting when we first tried this molecule in cells. Uh, so what you see here is treatment of a, a leukemia cell line uh, with only 100 nanomolar, so this is a relatively low concentration of this uh, heterobifunction molecule. So there is no transfection, no other manipulation involved. We just uh, add, a, add a drop of this, uh, of this uh, drug into tissue culture media and see what happens. And what we have observed that already two hours after treatment, we could observe near complete degradation of this protein uh, BD4, as measured here by Western blood. Uh, 
it became even more interesting to us when we asked the question, would that work in an animal? Would that be in vivo compatible? And we did one experiment where we had tumor cells grown uh, in a mouse, and we treated mice once with 50 milligr milligrams per kilogram, uh, which is also a relatively uh, low concentration, took out the tumors a couple of hours later, and did immunohistochemistry. So we stained for protein abundance in those tumors, and brown staining would mean high levels of BRD4. So you see that these cancer cells are loaded with very high levels of BRD4, only a couple of hours after treatment with our uh, molecule, you see that BD4 is significantly destabilized in those tumors, which went along with uh, destabilization of CMIG, which is a transcriptional downstream target of BD4, and also downregulation of this anti-proliferative marker, KI67. Importantly, if we continued treatment of these tumor-bearing mice with a molecule, we could show that we could attenuate uh, tumor growth uh, over time. So the next question we asked ourselves, um, how selective is this? Are we degrading just every other protein uh, in the cell and we just happen to look at BRD4 and so that's uh, why we're getting excited about? Uh, and in order to answer that question, we decided to do quantitative mass spectrometry. Uh, so what you see here is uh, treatment with this parental ligand, just a bromodomain uh, inhibitor. Again, of an uh, uh, acute myelin leukemia cell line for two hours. And with mass spectrometry, we can now measure and quantify more than 7,000 proteins in parallel. Uh, and when we do this, we only see two proteins that are somewhat destabilized. Uh, one protein is called CMIG, the other one is called PIM1, and for both of them, we know that these are transcriptional downstream uh, consequences of degrading BRD4. If we do the same experiment with a bad degrader, we see these two transcriptional consequences, so indirect effects, but then we see BRD4, BRD3, and BRD2, which were exactly those proteins we knew from recombinant assays that our molecule would be binding to. So by that we have established that it works in vivo and that it is also uh, highly selective. Then it turned out that when you tell or when you want to convince an editor that you have invented a new generalizable uh, method that you actually need to show that it works for more than one target. So we could also show in our index paper that it works uh, for another protein, a prolyl isomerase called FKBP12. And that was luckily sufficient for this first hurdle. Uh, I would still be careful calling this a generalizable approach, but luckily over the last couple of years, uh, my previous lab, my own research lab, and many other colleagues in the field from academia uh, and pharma have now shown that this approach works for many different uh, proteins. So uh, it's very fair to say at this point that uh, conjugation to uh, thalamides <coughs> is, a very, uh, is a generalizable solution uh, to target protein degradation. One of the things uh, I want to highlight now, some of these uh, particularities of protein degradation. So we uh, identified that when we tested a bed degrader to, and compared it to a bed inhibitor in different leukemia cellular models, that the degrader was always much more active, uh, up to a factor of 100 times more potent uh, than the inhibitor, which was kind of striking because in the end we perturbed the same protein, which is whether we inhibit it or whether we degrade it. In order to understand why this is, because BRD4 is a gene control factor, we decided to simply do spike normalized RNA sequencing. So we just measured a normalized abundance of transcripts. And what turns out, uh, or what we figured out by doing so, is that while when we treat cells with a BET inhibitor or BRD4 inhibitor, we change abundance of around uh, 1,000 to 2,000 genes. When we do the same uh, with the BET degrader, uh, basically every transcript that we can measure is strongly uh, downregulated. In order to understand how that works, uh, we performed a chip seq experiment for an elongating form of RNA polymerase tool, the protein that synthesizes uh, mRNAs. And what I've shown you here only on, uh, on, for, on a one gene basis, while there's many genes that simply don't care about uh, treatment with that bad inhibitor, the same gene is completely eradicated for this elongating uh, RNA polymerase. Uh, and again, to understand this mechanistically, we teamed up uh, with uh, Andreas Meyer, uh, at this time a, a postdoc in Sterling Churchman's lab at Harvard Medical School, now a group leader at the MPI uh, in Berlin, to perform um, a nascent sequencing approach called NetSeq that allowed us to sequence nascent RNA that emerges uh, from the RNA polymerase enzyme. And what that, these two complicated plots should show you that for every, we, can, we could measure for every uh, gene in the genome, how much polymerase sits at the beginning of the gene and how much polymerase is elongating through the gene, processively synthesizing the gene. And what you see here is that when we treat cells with this bed inhibitor, not much, ha not much happens. 
If we do the same with the bed degrader, you see this entire cloud of genes tilting uh, towards your upper left. And what this means is that, that every single of those genes, polymerase fails to processively elongate. It just arrests at the beginning of the gene. Uh, and so in this case, this differential molecular pharmacology of an inhibitor versus a degrader really allowed us to uh, position BD4 as a master regulator for transcription elongation. I've shown you that uh, targeted protein degradation can be incredibly selective. Uh, sometimes it can be more selective than uh, we initially have hoped. Uh, and so what I'm showing you here is a collaboration of my group with the uh, lab of uh, Nathaniel Gray, our former lab neighbors uh, at the Dana-Farber. We, what you see here is, uh, is a crystal structure overlay of two kinases. Uh, one is called CDK4, one is called CDK6. They are uh, homo very closely related homologs that within these kinase or ATP binding site uh, have, I think, around 94 to 95% sequence identity. So, Largely speaking, those are identical uh, kinases. And you see here uh, a kinase inhibitor, which is uh, clinically approved, called uh, palposiclip, uh, binding to uh, this superimposition of both of these kinases. So because they are basically identical, um, you can imagine that it's very hard, and by very hard I basically mean impossible, to identify a small molecule inhibitor that would, for instance, only inhibit CDK6 while sparing uh, CDK4. Uh, then you might ask, why would I care? Uh, but what I can tell you is that CDK6, that many, for instance, uh, acute leukemia cell lines, are highly addicted to having CDK6 present, but they don't really care about having CDK4. So if we would have a medicine that would selectively inhibit 6 over 4, we could anticipate that we have a very large uh, therapeutic window for those patients. And so we set out with Nathaniel uh, and uh, one of his uh, talented postdocs, uh, Bei Zhang Zhang, to identify molecules that would selectively uh, degrade uh, one over the other. Uh, and we uh, achieved this. Uh, so you see here uh, this molecule called BSJ03123. We didn't come up with a you know, shorter uh, nomenclature. Uh, and what these molecules can do is that it already at 15 nanomolar, it selectively destabilizes CDK6 while leaving uh, the other homolog CDK4 unharmed. Again, we can play the trick with expression proteomics where we don't only look at CDK4 and CDK6, but look at uh, seven or 8,000 proteins, quantify all of them, and see that uh, in the entire proteome, the only protein that is destabilized is this uh, target CDK6. So we achieved uh, exquisite selectivity for this important cancer target. Uh, asking why we see it, this selectivity, uh, we developed a um, split nanoluciferase assay. Uh, that works in intact cells and that allows us to measure whether our small molecule can induce closeness, uh, again, uh, between the e 3 ligase cerebellum and either CDK4 or CDK6. And when we ran this assay uh, in a time-resolved manner, you can see that uh, we can very successfully and rapidly in a dose-dependent manner uh, induce the ternary complex formation between uh, cerebellum and CDK6 but we fail to do so with CDK4. So this suggests that there are some steric hindrances that prevent this ternary complex formation, and this is really the source uh, for the selectivity. Um, so when we compare targeted protein degradation to traditional perturbation strategies, such as classic pharmacologic in inhibition or genetic approaches, it really appears as if protein degradation combines the best of both worlds, uh, because we have we still conserve many of these very favorable uh, features of pharmacologic inhibition, such as dosage control. The more we add the, of the drug, the stronger the effect is. Uh, reversibility uh, or very fast kinetics. I've shown you that degradation can work within an hour or, or even faster. However, while pharmacologic inhibition only always targets the particular activity, for instance, we inhibit the kinase function of a kinase or the protease function of a protease, Targeted protein degradation is much more closer to a genetic approach because we take out the entire protein. Uh, and so then you might ask, okay, that sounds great, but I don't have a chemist in the lab or I don't work with chemists, so how can I take advantage of this? What can I do if I have no ligand? Uh, and in order to help you with this, we developed another approach that we call the degradation tag or the D-tag approach that is dependent on uh, knocking of a uh, low molecular weight protein, uh, again this FKBP uh, protein, it's 12 kilodalton, that then we can do this either ectopically or endogenously with, endogenously with CRISPR, that then results in the expression of a fusion protein. 
Uh, and then we can use one single standardized ligand that doesn't bind to the protein, it just binds to the tag. Uh, and so we have, control, again, chemical control over target protein abundance. Uh, and here you see just one uh, Western blood experiment <clears throat> done by a student in my lab, where you see that when we treat uh, these cells where uh, a kinase called CDK6 has been tagged with this degradation tag, within 30 minutes we can observe near complete uh, proteasomal uh, degradation of this factor. Uh, the first time we used this DTAG approach to really study biology was when I had the pleasure of working with a very talented PhD student still in my postdoc lab. Um, his name is Michael Earp, who since then went on to actually already re lead his own group at the Scripps Institute in San Diego. And we wanted to understand why certain uh, acute leukemia cells are dependent on another gene control factor called ENL. Uh, and using the DTAG approach, we, find, we found that ENL binds almost in, over the entire genome, but it binds at certain key spots with a very high uh, concentration. And all of these key spots are transcription factors, such as MIP, such as CMIG or HOX genes, that are very vital to the proliferation of leukemia cells. Um, so, and as you could maybe imagine, once we degraded ENL and measured uh, global gene expression, we saw exactly those uh, very essential transcription regulators uh, being downregulated. So in summary, I hope I could show you uh, that targeted protein degradation is a really an all-chemical and generalizable solution. Um, it's a very potent mechanism, and I didn't have time to go into this. Uh, the, one of the sources for its potency is because it's a catalytic mechanism of action. So why typically small molecules need to stay bound to a target protein in order to keep this target protein inhibited. Our molecules bring the protein to the three ligase, induce the degradation, but then they're free to do the same trick again, and again, and again. So the same small molecule, one equivalent of small molecule, can induce the degradation of multiple equivalents of the target protein of interest. And so this has led to the second and third generation degraders from us and other groups, as from us and other groups that are active already in the picomolar range. So we made them again a thousand times more potent uh, than our earliest compounds. I've shown you that it's highly selective and also in vivo compatible. Uh, really outlining the strategy or outlining this as a strategy that might lead to novel drugs. And this also led to a massive interest in uh, biotech uh, and pharma. And I stopped counting at a certain point, but there's multiple companies that are pursuing this approach now uh, in biotech. Most, if not all of them, have very lucrative deals with uh, big pharma. Uh, C4 Therapeutics was the company that got spun out of uh, our work in, in, in Jay Bradner's lab at the Dana-Farber. And uh, very excitingly, the first uh, clinical trials in, in humans have actually been started uh, beginning of this year, I think March uh, this year, uh, by a company uh, called Arvinas in New Haven, uh, which was founded by uh, one of the pioneers in this field, uh, Craig Cruz. And we're obviously all very eagerly awaiting the results of this trial. And I want to finish with really the most important uh, slide of this talk, which is the acknowledgement uh, slide. Um, a lot of the work that I've shown you today was work done during my postdoc time in, in Jay Bradner's lab, and I want to mention uh, two people uh, in particular. The first one being Jay, who has been just a tremendous mentor uh, throughout my, my postdoc uh, and keeps being a friend uh, uh, who is just, uh, it's great hanging out with him and, and seeking his advice uh, if he has time. Uh, the second person I want to highlight is Dennis Buckley, a super talented chemist who was uh, my partner in crime for uh, most of these studies, and it wouldn't have been possible uh, without him. There's many more people uh, in the, in the Bradner lab, uh, all of which I want to acknowledge, uh, particularly my wife, who uh, happened to come with me uh, to Boston. Uh, and then there's key collaborators uh, throughout uh, the, the years. And then also very importantly, I want to feature uh, students and postdocs uh, in my own research lab, now at the Center of Molecular Medicine. Uh, uh, it's, we've been great fun. If you have good students, then feel free to send them to us. We're taking good care of them. As you see, we do a lot of book reading and study groups. And uh, lastly, I want to acknowledge the funding sources uh, without whom nothing of this uh, would work. And uh, with this, I thank you for your attention uh, and uh, yeah, for getting into suits on such a warm uh, summer day. Thank you very much. Thank you.